Welcome to the Time Scales Interviews. I'm Grego, your host. Today we have a very special guest, the self-proclaimed Birmingham's King of the Geeks. This is none other than Dan Hadley himself. Hi, Dan. Uh, hello, hello, Greg. Nice to be here at long, long last. Is this the longest time that it's taken you to set up an interview? I think we've been talking yes, about, about six months. I, th I think <laughs> it is. Yeah, I, I, I think we've been talking about doing this since around Thanksgiving. So, yeah, yeah, yes. it has been. And I'm really glad to be able to catch up to you. Sorry for the delays. You know, we went to Japan for March. Uh, so so that month was out. Uh, and, uh, Dan, I am actually really surprised by the large amount of uh, media produced by you on Facebook. And Doctor Who, <laughs> uh, the Type 40 podcast, the list goes on. It's just, to me, it's really crazy insane how much content you're producing can you tell us what is up over there? What are you doing? <laughs> what, what am I doing? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? What's all this about? That's usually right. that's usually what the arresting officer says. <laughs> I tend to find. Um, I mean, <laughs> well, this is it. I mean, I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy doing it. It's it's. I suppose the um, the stock answer is the one that they always give you. Why climb a rock? Because it's there. There you go. <laughs> it, I I love making this content. Uh, the glib answer would be. I've been talking about Doctor Who all of my life, uh, pretty much all of my life, to whoever will listen. And so I'd be having these conversations anyway for hours on end. So there's not really any difference between talking to, to my nearest and dearest and driving them mad or talking to myself, which, let's be honest, I do that quite a lot. <laughs> Probably doesn't come as a great surprise to you. And so I do talk to myself quite a lot. I thought, yeah, talk to the world, talk to the internet, talk to one or two people, whatever, just talk about it and put it out there. And that way it, it goes somewhere, somewhere out there, rather than me continuing to say it all. But I want to back up a little bit, actually, Greg, because I want to pull you up on something. You said okay. that I was you said that I was the self-styled Birmingham's King of the Geeks. What makes, you, <laughs> what makes you think that I am self-proclaimed? Because that's not true either. Uh, it's not. Okay. It's not, not that name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that name. I mean, so, let's be honest, everybody. I know that that's a ridiculous thing to say. Of course it is. Who would say something like that? But no, it wasn't. That that title was bestowed upon me, believe it or not, by wow. by a person, a very important person in my life, who's no longer no longer with us. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I I so willingly inherited that title and sort of and. Uh, Owned it, shall we say? Owned it. I mean, some people, some people listen or watch watch the shows, the content that I put out, and they see it for the first time. And occasionally, I get some feedback about that, and people say, you know, well, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Who's this guy to claim this? <laughs> as if I'm being, <laughs> as if I'm being serious about it. I'm very, <laughs> I'm not very serious about very many things when it comes to uh, when it comes to monkeying about on the mic and on the webcam and whatever else, as I'm sure you'll find out over the next, however long we're going to be having this conversation. I also talk far too much. Well, that that's good. That, that That's actually, that's an exceptional talent. And, and uh, which reminds me, this interview is being conducted in California and England. And uh, obviously Dan is in Birmingham. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with the British map. Where is Birmingham compared to London? I know where London is. We, uh, we dress to the left and slightly up. So if you go, okay. if you look at a map of a map of Great Britain and England, and you go to the sort of the centre, which is the Midlands region, Birmingham is slightly to the left. So it's uh, it's quite close to Wales. So it's it's um, okay. yeah, we're we're pretty close to Wales as you as you see it on the map onto the Welsh border. Because again, while I'm dishing out the secrets, everybody, or, or telling you things I don't think I've said I've said on on camera before, I don't actually live in Birmingham. <laughs> it's just the fact that when people, because the world's a big place and the internet's a very big place in, in particular. And, uh, and so uh, when you look at the map of the general area where I am, the, the biggest city where there's a big spot on the map is, is Birmingham. So I say Birmingham's king of the geeks, but I'm, I'm closer to other places. I don't actually live in Birmingham. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. I All right. Know. Um, now, you already know this. Uh, when mm. I started watching your program, um, I was very surprised uh, because of how much I enjoyed it. And I was surprised that I had never heard of you before. Now, this was sometime, I guess, last year or maybe the, the year before. Um, and uh, because the Internet, as you said, the Internet is a large place. Um, Doctor Who fandom really isn't 
so large when it comes down to it. There, there seems to be uh, limitations as to how many people that you will find in groups, such as on forums or on Twitter or what have it you. Is a big, and, it is a big fandom, and yet you do tend to bump into the same people over and over again. I mean, before we started recording, you mentioned two people that you were about to speak to or have spoken to, and I know mm -hmm. both of those guys. <laughs> right. Okay. That's a very good example. So what I was surprised about is that uh, – I hadn't heard of you because I thought, wow, this guy is really into Doctor Who and he's not just uh, making content. He's legit. He really does love Doctor Who and other uh, programs that I do, like uh, Star Trek, for example. Um, so did going back a couple of decades, have you used a handle online or have you just always gone by Dan Hadley? Always gone by Dan Hadley. Always. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, I don't know why. I uh, maybe that's that. Some people would consider that quite foolish. I think, particularly how the internet can be, and particularly how some social media platforms can be. But no, I've mm -hmm. I've always gone by my own name. I had no reason not to, and I've never had any any um, any bones about standing up for the things that I say and my views, my opinions. Uh, so I've always been happy to just use my own name. It takes, and also. I think if I was to come up with something that would be, I don't know, quite glib or satirical in some way, you know, it's, it, yeah, I'd, I'd probably tire of that quite quickly. I'd rather just be me. Okay. And <laughs> nothing to hide. Okay. Very good. Well, you know, chances are good that I did run into you at some point. I used to be on forums. It's been years ago since I've used those. And I, I have to have seen you uh, before running into you on YouTube and Twitter. And I guess at the time, I must have just uh, thought, wow, well, this is just some crazy person using their real name. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> <a doctor> who, <laughs> who, who would do something like that? Yeah, so I, I was on, I'm still a member. I'm, I've still got an account on Gallifrey Base. <gasps> I know, I know. The Valley of the I Dead. I remember that one. Gallifrey Base. And I remember when it was Outpost Gallifrey, I, I used that. I used to spend a lot more time in it when it was Outpost Gallifrey. I think it was a nicer place to be back then, if truth be told. Uh, nothing against uh, the people who run the the uh, the site now, but it's not what it once was. And so, yeah, so I have been around. I have done those things and been in those places. But again, you know, it's 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 a small big fandom at the time. Okay. Okay. So very good. Uh, so let's let's focus on you. Um, here's mm. that broad, open-ended question that you can run with: Who are you, and where do you come from? My name's Dan Hadley. <laughs> I think I've got that. Yes, yeah, so my name's Dan Hadley, and I am. I am from uh, Birmingham, but not really. So that's cleared that up. Uh, yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so I am a, uh, a content creator, I suppose you could say, but I'm actually a career creative, a sometime educator, entertainer, and all manner of other hats that I sort of swap around and wear in my in my day to day, night to night life. And I live in the West Midlands in England. In Great Britain, there we go. Been a Doctor Who okay. fan all my life, and uh, and that's I suppose that's what's brought us together to talk today, really. Okay, perfect. Um, now, do you, as far as content creation, uh, you're obviously talented. Uh, the the uh, Spacebook and Type Forty programs are some of the best Doctor Who content that's being produced. Um, have Have you? Uh, you said that I didn't. Around... <laughs> well, I believe it's true. Yeah. And you can Thank quote you. me on that. Um, Very sweet. But uh, did you find yourself being interested in media, uh, content creation, radio, or anything like that uh, when you were a kid, perhaps in grade school? I was. I was. Mm. I used to, I mean, it's the standard story, I suppose, that in Doctor Who terms, in the pre VHS days, I used to. Actually, no, it wasn't just pre VHS. VHS was quite expensive when it was first available. So I think I had like, the, we had three video cassettes to, to use in, our, in the VCR. And so I couldn't keep Doctor Who episodes. So I used to record them onto audio cassettes and listen to the soundtracks for years and years and years afterwards. But I was always interested in the radio, always interested in television and the media. I listened to a lot of radio when I was a kid because of various things that were going on in, in the family at that time. So I, I had the radio on quite a lot. And listen to a lot of uh, LPs, vinyl LPs of comedians and things like that. So yeah, I was. I think I was more interested in it than I've been aware of until until quite recently. I, th I think I watched a lot of television, listened to a lot of radio, and I think it all kind of 
went in somewhere. When I was at school, though, there was no such thing. You couldn't really do anything with, with an interest in that kind of material back then. There was no such thing as media studies when I was at school. And so if you had an interest in production, in the media, in that line of, in that line of work, exploring that as a craft, there was no, nowhere to go, really. I suppose the, the closest would have been to get into journalism somehow through the written word. And I was interested in English. I, I was. I did English to, to a pretty pretty high educational standard. But again, it didn't seem like a natural fit for me. I was an, an arty kid, a, a creative kid, like a lot of Doctor Who fans were and still are. So it was all about the art for me. And that's that's what I've made my my real my re- real career as a creative designer, graphic artist, and a caricature artist, all that kind of thing. Okay, that's interesting. Now, um, with your talent uh, at being creative uh, in in early cutting edge areas, you know, I, I remember when VCRs uh, came out, and I think our family had just a couple of tapes also, and so they they had to be uh, re recorded over. Um, now, when when you first uh, discovered interests as such, um, did you happen to have any mentors around you, anybody that supported you in your areas of interest, uh, anyone that, that complimented or encouraged you? None whatsoever. <laughs> That's a wow. short, short okay. answer, but yeah, none at all. No, uh, nobody in the family or uh, no, it was it was quite a solitary thing. Strange, okay. isn't it? All right. Strange. Yeah. No, yeah when, you say, when you say tech loud, it's just strange. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is surprising to me. It seems very common for people who have become uh, a stage uh, actors in particular um, and authors um, and television actors. They have had encouragement uh, from a young age. And in fact, I've found a lot of people uh, when, when reflecting on such things, they will actually recall the names of particular teachers. Um, that, so that one-to-one encourage encouragement, not, ne- not inspiration necessarily, but actual one-to-one encouragement and mentorship of, of sorts. Never had anything like that. Okay, very interesting. All right, so um, when did you first start watching Doctor Who, and who is your doctor? When did I first start watching Doctor Who? Uh, I one of my earliest memories is Doctor. I never, I, I've never not watched Doctor Who. Doctor Who is literally one of the very f- earliest of my memories of anything at all. So that being uh, 1975. So <laughs> yeah, so back in 1975, one of my earliest memories is of a Doctor Who episode, which I now know to be the pyramids, the pyramids of Mars episode three, is the one that I I remember first. And uh, yes, yeah, so that was obviously a Tom Baker story. I uh, watched the show, I wouldn't say religiously, but regularly, all that time, all through the Tom Baker era, whenever I could. I, I imagine there was plenty that I missed because I, obviously I was, I was very, very young. And um, yeah, it, it was never not on. And I know you've probably heard this over and over again, and I'm going to say it again anyway. It can't be overstressed um, how much a part of the fabric of British society and, and culture, particularly during the 70s and into the, into the early to mid-80s, Doctor Who was. I wouldn't say it was a show that every, everybody watched, but the viewing figures were very, very high. The awareness of it was widespread. It was a, a real, uh, fundamental, a cultural touchstone. Everybody knew what the TARDIS was, what a Dalek said. And the man in the floppy in the floppy scarf with the big goggly eyes, everybody knew who Tom Baker was. You know, so it it was a a big deal. One of the Brit- the biggest shows on British television that was, even though it had only been on for like fifteen years at that point, it, television was um it wasn't in its infancy as such, but it was probably booming around that time. It was the golden age, and Doctor Who was very much in the dead centre of that because of that precise way in which it's aimed at, at different levels, different demographics to bring them all together in front of the television at the same time to often in often times get completely different things out of the same 25 minutes of content. It's an extraordinary show. It was then and it still is now. Okay. Now I have heard uh, similar comments like that. And to me, uh, being an American, it's, it's hard to grasp that because uh, 
apparently you and I started watching around the same time, uh, the, the Tom Baker era, but in the States, Doctor Who was a rarity. Um, and you had to, number one, be aware of it. Uh, and, and and there wasn't uh, much way to be aware of it because we had no internet. Uh, and then number two, you'd have to know where to be able to find it. Find and it was, it. yeah, and it was on... Uh, PBS channels here, which were considerably smaller than the major networks. Um, I believe even as late as the 80s, we still had uh, just three big major networks. And then you had the uh, lower powered broadcasts of PBS from smaller stations. And then you would have to know when it was on, which you could use a magazine called TV Guide that came in the mail and look for Doctor Who to find out when it was going to be on. Uh, and so it, it really, it, it was not part of our culture. So it, it's interesting for me to see people speak as uh, you just have of how everybody knew what the Daleks said and, and uh, everyone was aware of the man. Yeah, it it couldn't, have been, couldn't have been more mainstream. So for okay. a show that's known as sort of geeky and culty, even now I think it's drifted back to that lately. Um, but that became known as a, a show that only odd people were interested in. It did, it did become that way. Um, but no, it, it's it. The, you couldn't find a more mainstream program than than Doctor Who. Really, it was a mainstream program that to, that told unusual stories in the most creative of ways. I think. Okay, so do you have a doctor? One that would, you would consider to be your doctor? My doctor is uh, it's not the first one that I saw, just to be, I only do that to be awkward, everybody, because we all know that that's, okay. that's supposed to be the case. My doctor is Peter Davison, <laughs> so the one that would come directly afterwards, because I was a viewer of Doctor Who, and I, I loved Doctor Who, and I, I tried not to miss it when Tom Baker was doing it, because I'd, you know, I say everybody loved Tom Baker, but I was aware that the show was, you know, it was, it was something that had always been there, I suppose, and... Um, we, I think we, when, we, when things have always been there, obviously we take them a little for granted, and particularly when they always look the same, you know, the same opening credits and things like that. But when they, when they changed the Doctor, it came so, so a left field for me. I had no idea that other people had played Doctor Who before, and I'd always loved the show, but to be getting this brand new Doctor... That was that was going to be mine. So there, were, there weren't going to be episodes that I'd have missed. This was my chance to be on board with something and someone right from the start. I just latched onto it right away, and that episode, that final Tom Baker episode, uh, Legopolis Part Four, the, seeing witnessing that regeneration was what um, turned me from a viewer into a into a fan. I became that regeneration, the idea of, of renewal. And the uh, the old man in the young man's body that was that was what captivated really captivated my imagination and I think uh, bonded me melded me to this show for the rest of the rest of my life I would say I can't imagine <laughs> it's going to end any time soon my my connection to it okay that's that's interesting Dan we have that in common as well uh, when uh, the doctor regenerated uh, in Log Logopolis and then of course started with Castro was it Castro Valva. The first, mm, yeah, the first fifth doctor. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about a regeneration. So it was actually a real screen surprise uh, here in the States, uh, watching it on public broadcasting. Um, it, I was like, what? How, how in the world? Isn't this the main actor of the show? How can how can that change? So it was it was a real shock. And we don't get surprise regenerations anymore. But so to you, when uh, Tom Baker went to Peter Davison, that was a surprise to you? It wasn't a surprise because, as I say, Doctor Who was a mainstream show. And it had been on okay. the national news, all over the newspapers that Tom Baker was leaving. Peter Davison was mm -hmm. coming in. Peter Davison himself was a fairly famous actor. He'd just come out of a, a really big drama series that was very, very popular. And so it had been, it was high profile news and everybody knew it was coming, but even so to see it and that, that had piqued my interest. I thought, well, I've got to a, another doctor. How's this going to happen? What, how, how, when none of it made any sense to me until I saw it, until I saw it on screen and, and uh, saw how it worked, how it made me feel. 
uh, yeah, it was very, very heady. And it was yeah, 25 minutes of television that, that uh, changed my life. Okay. Um, now, I've always had this, pers- uh, th- this uh, idea that there is something known as a surprise regeneration where people are actually genuinely surprised. And what you just mentioned with the British media covering it, where uh, people uh, in England were aware of the fact that Tom Baker had left, um, and perhaps maybe you even knew who the new actor was. Have you ever experienced a surprise regeneration, or is there no. even any such thing? No. It's, ju- it's, no. it's just impossible in Great Britain, unless, unless you're okay. somebody who's only a – the tiniest of passing interests in the show, and they go, "Oh, they've changed Doctor <laughs> Who again. They've changed Doctor Who again. Who is it this time?" You know, really, it is. It is that big headline news. You know, even though we live in an age now where uh, newspapers are kind of dying out, they still anything Doctor Who related, any whisper. You know, you've probably seen any time the mirror gets a, a whisper of something Who related, they plaster it everywhere. And it's the same with any newspaper. It's still big news, and the, you know, it's. it's a secret regeneration, it's never, I don't think it's ever going to happen. The co- closest we've probably ever got was a few months ago when we weren't 100% sure who was going to be there, stood on the end of the cliff at the end of the power of the Doctor. Would it be Shooty Gatwa? Would it be David Tennant? That's probably the closest mm. we've ever had where it's down to the two contenders. But the idea that it could literally be anybody, I don't think we're ever going to be in a position where we'll we'll have that myself. Like, it could be wrong, but I, I think okay. I'm right. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So I guess maybe a surprise regeneration was kind of an American thing pre-internet, when when we had yeah. no news over here. Um, that's interesting. I never realized that. Because it's the um, same with so. us, with, with international shows that we get here, whether they're from the States or Australia, particularly if it's older content, there'd just be no way. I mean, particularly in, in the pre-internet days, any imported shows that came here, we had no idea what was going to happen in any of those either. Cast members would... would get killed off or, you know, new people would arrive in or people would come back and we'd never have the faintest idea what was going on because it'd been, it had been produced either continents apart or in some cases years apart. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't fresh news anymore. And uh, you know, we had no internet to tap into any source of news to research it. So it's, it works exactly the same way. Okay. Very good. All right. We're going to get into your programs here, but I have uh, one more question about you. Mm. Um, a fun one here. Do you have any crazy secret hobbies like skydiving or stamp collecting? <laughs> crazy. I bet stamp collecting whilst I'm skydiving. That would be, that'd be pretty good. <laughs> there you go. Um, do, I have any, do I have any crazy hobbies? Well, isn't this it? Isn't this pretty crazy? Making content, talking about Doctor Who in one's uh, spare room for hours and end to whoever will listen. <laughs> That's, this is it. This is the crazy hobby. This is the <laughs> well. I I can't agree because I I have learned that I need to stop calling people crazy when I'm interviewing them. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe me, I've been called far far worse than that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you could say, how can this be a secret? Um, can something be a secret when you broadcast it to thousands of people? Um, but um, at the end of the day, you know, the, we talked about the Doctor Who community, the Doctor Who world, the Doctor Who fandom. You know, it's a world within a world, a minority within a, within a minority. And so, you know, people in my day-to-day life, some people know I do this, so it's not, you know, it's not a deep, dark secret. My family know what I get up to. I'm very supportive of it. And they, I dare say that particularly my, uh, my sons, are, I've got, I've got uh, several children, and some of whom work in the media, and they're very, very supportive and uh, behind me 100% in this. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'd say this is, this is the the crazy hobby that's sort of become something else, really. Yeah, it's it's grown more than I thought it would in quite a short period of time, I suppose. Okay, so you actually do have mentors, and it's modern day in, in the family, from what it sounds like. I wouldn't say not mentors, because they're my uh, my children. Uh, Encouragement, but, support. Yeah, I, ha- I have support, yeah. Okay, very good. All right, now, how uh, did you actually become a podcaster you know what happened did you did you get up one day uh, look out the window with coffee and go you know what i'm gonna become a youtuber <laughs> did, what was there some turning point when you actually decided i'm gonna start making content and putting it online uh, well i mean i've again that um that term 
I have to go back here. I corrected you at the top. I'm going to correct you. I, I've always kind of resisted the the idea of, that I'm a YouTuber, um, because I I view myself. YouTube is just one of several places that I put stuff, that I have conversations, or I, I talk to people, that I put content onto. Um, that set might sound like anybody who's familiar with the stuff that, that we make and the conversations that we do have might think that is ridiculous because I say I've, I'm, I'm there, I'm very, very present on it, but I, I don't view myself as a YouTuber. Maybe I should. I, I probably am. But first and foremost, I consider myself to be a podcaster. A, a podca- podcaster come broadcaster is how I view what I'm doing. Uh, it's just that YouTube is one of the places that we we put the content on, and um, I think that I think that there's value in doing that. I mean, it's certainly a lot of fun to do it, and it's we talked about creativity and earlier on. It's this is probably for my entire career has been in the creative arts. And yet this is probably the most creatively challenging thing I have ever done. It's drawn on many of the, of the things, of the skill sets that I've had in my, in my career over the decades. Work, you know, I've worked, worked for some big companies, with some big people and some big names. So it's drawn on all of that. But what it's also pulled in is what we were talking about, when, uh, about the media, about listening to radio and watching the television and taking all of that in. And it's, it's as if it's laid sort of dormant in me for a little while. I mean, I remember seeing podcasting explode in the mid noughties with, with people like Ricky Gervais. I think he was the guy who sort of first coined the idea of a, of a podcast and then a few people followed, followed afterwards. I watched podcasting take off and I was fascinated by it. And I think it took me a year or two before I heard one of anything. And I think the first thing I probably heard could have been Ricky Gervais. It was somebody quite mainstream. And then I found a Doctor Who pass- podcast of some kind. So I, I sort of tentatively looked, looked at it or listened to it. And, um, you know, and it's the same experience. You put, put the earphones in, you listen, and you invest in what people are saying or not, or you, you sometimes rant, sometimes rave, at what people are saying. You become sort of by proxy part of that conversation. So I, just, I became really aware, subliminally, I think, what it was for why it worked. And somehow, somehow, uh, I just had this blind, <laughs> somehow I can't explain it. I just know how to do that. I, I think it could have been my upbringing. I'd say it could be the, the things that I was exposed to as a child. I don't know, my interests. I just knew how to do it, knew that I could do it. It was just how to go about doing it. That was where the challenge was because obviously the podcasts over that 10 year period started to spring up and I was busy doing other things. So raising children and, 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 and uh, having a career and a, a life and a relationship and all those things that people do. But in the back of my head, it was always like, I'd, I'd love to try that. I'd love to, or maybe, you know, maybe one day an opportunity will arise or, or maybe I'll give it a go, but I was never sure how to go about doing that. And then a door did open uh, a blue paneled double door. Uh, when I, I got invited to uh, yeah to take part in a podcast, and it sort of sprang out from from there really. I uh, I got in I got talking to a couple of guys who run a podcasting network. I liked all their their other content. They were making content around uh, Star Trek and Highlander. So I'm quite a fan of Highlander. It's one of my favourite movies, the Christopher Lambert film from 1986. And uh, I I was speaking to these guys, and I said, you know, if um, but one of them mentioned that he, he loved Tom Baker's Doctor Who. And I said, well, you know, if you ever do a Doctor Who podcast, uh, it's, it's the law that you have a Brit on the panel. So, and, uh, <laughs> I kept a complete straight face. I said, it's the law that if you have a, you have a Brit on that. And I said, and if it's, if it's any Brit other than this Brit, I'll never speak to you again. And it all, it all happened from there. <laughs> Okay, that that's very interesting. Um, wow. Uh, how many? So, how many years have you been doing uh, Spacebook and and Type Forty? Spacebook and Type. Well, Spacebook is a sort of production house, really. That's 
that's the name that I work under in this in this field. That happened by accident too. The space book, the space book was a, a little joke of mine because uh, it's a uh, it started out just as a Facebook group, uh, just a little refuge for people to go to talk about geeky stuff. Where you know, because uh, when Facebook again, Facebook exploded 10, 12 years ago, and Facebook changes all the time, doesn't it? And you you have conversations about what's on telly, what you're watching and or reading, or what you're looking forward to coming out of the cinema. And what I found is that, that I would talk about those things online, on on so on social media, but members of my family who weren't interested in those topics would say, "Must you bang on about Doctor Who all day? Isn't there somewhere else you can go?" And Facebook introduced that thing where you could open up a group and add people in a in a private group, and so that kept all that chatter away from the walls of of loved ones who weren't interested in it. And so that's how that happened. And and yes, that the space book is was a Facebook group that became a YouTube channel. See all these things, it's sort of two lanes, two parallel la- lanes that have kind of crossed over and become one. So the space book and uh, and type 40 were originally completely completely separate things. But I, I went, I, I started work on the podcast. That was, you asked how long I've been doing it. Let's backtrack. I've got, got a few too many plates spinning, haven't I? I think it's me that's spinning them as well. So yeah, the podcast, <laughs> I've, been, I've been podcasting for five and a half years. So I went on. I went on with the guys from the Fandom Podcast Network, who have now become good friends of mine, and did a special show with them, which it was. It turned out it was a pilot show. Now I, I didn't know it at the time when we were recording it. I didn't know it was a pilot show, but it was a pilot show <laughs> for the podcast that I'm that I'm doing now. So we recorded that, and uh, and I was very happy. I enjoyed myself immensely on it. And it was a few weeks until I heard from them again. And they said, oh, it was great. And they said some nice things. They wanted me to do some more. So we, we're going to launch a Doctor Who podcast. And yes, you know, we want you to be part of it. If you've got any ideas, you know, we we, we want your creative input. And, uh, you know, so I worked with them on the format because obviously these guys have been running the Fandom Podcast Network for several years. It was very successful. And so I trusted them and they trusted me. They placed a great amount of faith in me. I wouldn't say I was a complete stranger, but I wasn't far off. So they trusted me with their baby and I trusted them with my ideas. And uh, that's how Type 40 was was born, really. We, we arrived at the name quite, quite quickly as well, it just seemed right. And the podcast itself was born, uh, I think it was the June. So it's, it's coming up to our fifth anniversary as the, as the Type 40 podcast. Okay, this is really interesting, Dan. You've um, you actually have me spinning plates now because I'm I'm learning more about this than what I expected, and it's 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 <laughs> really it's genuinely interesting. I mean, th- this is good. Um, you know, I hope when, they're when interested. You, you, I hope you're interested too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pe- people are going to be interested uh, because I believe the Type Forty uh, and the other programs are only going to grow. You know, I. I, when I first started watching them, I uh, looked at the numbers of viewers down at the bottom. And I, th- I'm, I would have expected there to be thousands of people watching the program. That's how much I enjoy, enjoyed it when I started mm. watching it. And I guess when you like something, it's easy to assume that everybody else must really like this also. And um, I believe that you, your program is going to grow. And yes, people are going to be interested in, in learning a, a bit more about you. Um, now, here's something. Um, I You just gave me about five more questions in my head. So yes, you, you got me spinning plates as well. But um, on your program, there's a good amount of interactivity because um, you normally have multiple people. I, I I think I may have seen you on a program where it was you and just another person, you know, just like we're doing right now. But mm-hmm. it seems that there's usually three or four or more. I may have seen even five or six or seven people. How do you find your uh, your your friends that you're interacting with, your co-hosts, uh, panelists, whatever you call them? How do you locate these people? Do you just uh, socially come <laughs> into contact with them? Do you pick them out? Do you go, oh, I like this person? Yeah, it's I'll usually like uh, yeah, chucking out time at the pub. I see who who's sort of in, hanging out <laughs> in a bus, a bus shelter in a semi-conscious state. You want to be on a Doctor <laughs> Who podcast? 
And, you know, obviously they, a lot of them, if they've got a kebab hanging out of their mouth, they're five pints in at, at the very, very least. Once they've agreed to something, I've got it in writing. They can't go back on it. It's legally, legally binding by that point. But, uh, no, <laughs> well, this is, this is the kind of stuff I come out with, you see. Um, yes. <laughs> what was the question again? So, <laughs> yeah, how do I, yeah, my friends. Well, yeah, I mean, this is, this is where things sort of splinter off again, really, because there's uh, the podcasting, the Type 40 podcast, and the show you're talking about, which is Type 40 Live, with a product placement, yeah. Type 40 Live, are kind of the same but different. So one is some, um, uh, the, the actual Type 40 podcast is a standard podcast where uh, it's news, reviews, interviews, geek outs, and deep dives is what I say in the, in the introduction. So it's a standard podcast, really. We do all of those things. We talk about some episodes. I interview people. Who are, who are daft enough, I mean kind enough, to agree to come on the show. So we have, we've had some great guests on over the years. So it's it's a very much what you'd expect a podcast to do. But uh, Type 40 Live, which is a sort of offshoot, that again, that also happened by accident. And it's, it's now, uh, easily, both shows have probably, they, they take as much, they take as much time to prepare for, uh, both shows have got their audience, but there's a crossover there. There's a crossover there too, because again, I started doing the podcasts just on audio recorded via Zoom, just as we're just as we're talking now, just using using this technology. And um, but the stuff on YouTube as Type Forty Live that happened. That was just an idea that myself and my longtime co-host Sarah had during the pandemic. So Type Forty Live started out as just a a, um, a lockdown project because we were all stuck in the house and we'd got various friends who were making content elsewhere, you know, between us, the contacts I'd made through podcasting and Sarah had made people that we knew some of whom are, you know, got quite big YouTube channels. We thought well, we'd get them all together. We'll all have a chat for a couple of hours and have some fun. Uh, and it was just, we, we hung it on. We came up with the concept and we just did this, what we thought was a one-off show. We'll call it type 40 live because we'll do it completely live which at the time, I mean, I can't believe <laughs> I'd never really done anything like that before. And uh, people, again, people liked it. So the two things have, have since become two parallel shows. So I have two Doctor Who podcasts under the One Umbrella brand. So what I realized was that I could bring people over from the podcast, people like Kyle, people like Simon, uh, people all over the world, because I've always had an international contributors to the podcast, I thought, well, I know that some of them would be very open to the idea of doing YouTube. So I brought some of them over to the YouTube stuff too. And it sort of took off from there. I mean, the, the people who are on the panels who are some of my regular playmates on our show, which is very much what Type 40 Live is. It's a gang show. It's it's all of us. I mean, some of them I've known, some of them I've known for years, some of them I've known for a few months, but there are others on that show Simon Horton, who I've known for, I've known for literally decades. Uh, it, but this show brings people together like that. And uh, this is, again, th this is how fandom used to be, I think is, is how I look at that show in particular. And the, the doors are always open is how I, how I view it, you know, for people to, um, to take part, you know, even by, even if it's just by proxy. So I think it's got that wonderful sort of gang like feel of your, you're in a pub, you're overhearing a conversation between five or six, five or six people. But the more that I do these things, because as a creative, I, I like to try new things with it. So it's, it's sort of evolved as well. The working visually with it rather than just with, with sound, I found, okay, well, I use this software to broadcast this stuff. What about if I did this? What about if I did that? And so it's allowed me to do things cr that explore creative ideas and uh, also bring that out of my, uh, my team as well, of my friends. So that most of them are fairly creative people who have their ideas, creative in one way or another. And together, We've just struck a, a nice balance with that. Okay. Very interesting. Um, you just gave me about five more questions here. <laughs> I, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure that made sense. No, you, no, no. You're no, still it, with us. No. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And okay. what it is is it's it it it's uh 
further proof that the pandemic had a silver lining because there are some good things that actually came out of the pandemic. Um, one of them is that it forced people to learn how to use Zoom. So I think it actually opened communications, not just yeah, in great. Doctor Who or any form of fandom, but just actual real communications with people globally, because it forced all of us to use these newfangled video phones. But it also did have an effect on uh, fandom and Doctor Who. If you look at what Emily Cook did uh, and all of the people that donated their time to try to help each other stay sane, or I say each other, help all of us stay sane during lockdown. Um, there was a lot of uh, really good quality free content that came out during the pandemic. And I would have never suspected that Type 40 Live um, was something that came from uh, the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, it, it was just so. a one-off thing. I mean, so my, I don't think she'd mind me saying this, but uh, Sarah was my, my good friend. So I've known her for, uh, for a few years. And our friendship has some, um, that means the world to me. We, I think we've, saw, we've seen each other few, through a few really tough times. It certainly means the world to me. And she was having a particularly rough time. And, um, and like I said, we, we knew various people between us. We thought, well, you know, all these people, they've never really spoken together. You know, and a couple of them were quite, you know, quite controversial figures. But we thought, you know, well, can we bring all these people together all on one live stream on YouTube for a chat? And, um, you know, what, what are people going to say? Well, let's find out. Let's just do it and let's have a laugh. And then we did. And it, it worked. But um, but it was originally just intended as a one-off thing, and we'll go then we'll go back to making the podcasts through Zoom, and that was that. But um, over time, I started to do more YouTube, uh, got really comfortable with it, started to get creative with it, had conversations about other things, and I, I, I interviewed some people connected with Star Trek, uh, for example, and and James Bond, and all all other things that I liked. But obviously, it kept coming back to Doctor Who, and somebody else. Somebody else said to me, another mate of mine said, you know, you really ought to make more Doctor Who content. I said, well, I, I make a podcast every, I mean, the Type 40 podcast comes out roughly every fortnight the, on the on the podcasts and things like that with the network. That's how it works with the network. You know, they guarantee me so many slots and I guarantee to, to fill those slots by producing a podcast at, at regular intervals. That's how networking works. And they deliver it to all the podcatchers and it goes to certain online radio platforms. It's, it's got a, a good, strong audience through that but obviously through youtube it was kind of like starting from scratch because there's a massive difference between you know because podcast uh, podcasting particularly uh, in the states and and uh, north america canada podcasts are very very big particularly streaming podcasts as entertainment podcasts aren't as big in britain as they are overseas um so yeah. th there's that but there's some, um, and then there's YouTube and they say that something like three quarters of the world watches YouTube in any given day or something like that. But there's not much of a crossover. You, I do find that people, generally speaking, people either listen to a lot of podcasts or watch a lot, watch a lot of YouTube. There's not much crossover between the two. So going to YouTube was pretty much like starting again. And, uh, and, but it was a place because we did that initial one-off show, that original live show. But it becoming a regular show again. It was it was because the pandemic was going on and on and on and on. And and Sarah and my other friend Ian Ian Diaz, who's a, a writer, a film director, a proper film director, directed several feature length films with people you've heard of in them, an award winning director too. He whispered to me, he said, "You know, you ought to make more Doctor Who shows. What about if we made if we made five? It's five shows it takes up till Christmas because then the, the lockdown, you know, then the lockdown will be, will be uh, off and we can all go back to our lives. And so, uh, oh, okay, we'll just make a few shows then. Five turned into 10 and uh, <laughs> lockdown, <laughs> lockdown was lifted. January came and we got messages. Yeah, you're going to do any more of those shows. I really like them. And we started to get people asked to come on. Uh, Doc, uh, Doctor Who writers, we got Bob Baker was a guest on one of the shows, the late Bob Baker. And and Paul Tams is his associate producer on the K and I on the K and I show. As we yeah, and we had people get in touch, you know, people who had stuff they wanted us to hear and talk about and review. And um, so between us, thought, well, it wouldn't hurt to make another ten, would it? <laughs> Ninety shows later, <laughs> still, still there. <laughs> and what is the name of this network? 
the it's network the, uh, the podcast the podcasts are on the fandom podcast network okay. which i'm the creative i'm the creative director of now. okay all right very really interesting um now you uh so had mentioned that you don't consider yourself a YouTuber because YouTube is just one platform that you use and you, yeah. you prefer uh, Bing Point as a podcaster. Um, do you consider yourself an influencer? <laughs> <laughs> an influencer. I thought you'd like, uh, I thought yeah. you'd like that one. <laughs> that uh, influencer. I mean, that's <laughs> that sort of stinks of the Kardashians and all that sort of stuff. Does it? I've never really been sure. I've never really been sure what it is that influencers do. I, I have to be, I have to be honest. Uh, I no, I'm I'm not an influencer. And no. <laughs> the very the very right. idea the very idea is, is hilarious. I mean, seriously, if if anybody is influenced by anything that I've ever said, I, I don't know for better or worse, I can't, you know, I can't legislate for that. I think thinking along those lines is kind of unhealthy. And I look look at influencers, anybody who describes themselves as an influencer with a certain <laughs> amount of disdain. I mean, this is one of the reasons why, I, you know, I make content, I make content under my own name. Everybody knows what I look like. Everybody knows where I live, generally speaking, but in the Birmingham area. And I've been I've been happy to be, you know, very transparent about that. I'm, I'm just a normal bloke. I just happen to like Doctor Who. I uh, know which end of a mic is the bit you speak into. And how to look into one of those and yeah, things, things like that. But generally speaking, I'm I'm pretty much a normal guy, and I relate to people in normal ways. You know, Doctor Who television. These are things that we we all watch the telly. We all know you know what we like and what we don't. Uh, there are, I mean, I, I have um, I have values, I have beliefs, and I'd like to think, and I have a personality, and I'd like to think that all those things translate so that people people know who I am. Uh, but um, you know, all, all comes out through the, the brand of conversation that I, I like to have and, and my own tastes. I would imagine all that comes through too. Um, but uh, no, I mean, if I, I suppose I want to, I'd like to think I could encourage something, the idea that, you know, even though the world may change and, and social media evolves and platforms evolve, that um, you can overcomplicate these things and, and it, can, it can get in the way. And politics in particular, and identity politics, even more so, can get in the way of what any fandom is really about. It's about people and connecting and communicating and a free exchange of ideas and experience. So that's, we all get together, we've all watched the same TV show, yet we come together and we explain about the things that we liked, the things that we didn't, and explore the areas in which those things may cross over, may be the same, or may not be. And that's, to me, that's where the real gold is. That's what's really interesting about the way this material can be, can be processed and the different things that different personalities can get out of it. Okay. You, uh, that is absolutely interesting, Dan. And you have just started going the direction that uh, I, I, I really need to go here um, because this is something that people are going to be watching for and they're going to be interested in it. Um, Back, you had mentioned that this took us about six months to be able to finally get together and record this. Um, and I'm glad that it took that long because I actually wanted to learn more about your program. That way um, I knew who I was talking to. Basically, I needed to. That way I knew what to ask and, and what to, to, to question you yeah, about. Yeah. And I think you do know that I used, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I used a piece of AI. Um, it's a server which is not available to the public yet it's in testing and i used a piece of ai where you can copy a url of a video page and you can click on and select one person out of the conversation and it will go through and play just what that one person is saying so what i did is i watched a couple of uh of your programs where i just looked at snippets of what you were saying because i wanted to see if you were neutral in most conversations and i concluded that you are now there that being said you uh, concluded or the ai concluded the, well the ai helped me conclude oh, okay. it, took a human, it took a human to come to a good conclusion <laughs> by watching the content okay. okay but um i don't really uh, understand I, but i'm I, nodding my head anyway greg <laughs> you know, okay. Well, once it's open, I will send it to you and you can try it. It's Thank really you. interesting. We, you just it, It's so simple. Mm. Just point and click. 
and and it allows you to take a program with multiple people and only and it scans through and finds only that person and you I remember you explained uh, you explained yeah. to me yeah a few weeks ago and but it takes a while I can be a bit thick I've got a very yeah. very, very, <laughs> so, very very small brain everybody big mouth but very very small brain <laughs> so now it started to register with me a little more okay so the question is is your show intended to be uh contra- controversial and I think I already know the answer but um, here's why I have to ask that, because I myself have seen some views on your show <laughs> that I, I don't agree with, okay? Me and too. you know what? That's fine. I have no apology for not agreeing with it. Um, but I've also seen some views that I are, are, are those of my own. And I think it is interesting that a program can allow people to express their actual thoughts and opinions without fear of being canceled or, 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 or banned or, or compartmentalized. And Mm -hmm. this is going back to, you mentioned a forum earlier, which I haven't seen for years um, because it seems as if people uh, of groups uh, attempt to compartmentalize other people that think differently or, or they don't agree with. And with your program uh, I have seen some things that, I could see it being real easy that it could upset somebody. But at the end of the program, I don't care because I have I, I have pretty thick skin. But um, you see where I'm going here? I, I have to ask, yes. is it intended to be controversial or do you allow it uh, to be controversial? Uh, I, I guess that's it. Well, Go it's ahead. interesting. It's interesting to me, isn't it? Because how quickly we forget that all of fandom, all of discourse around Doctor Who fandom, used to be exactly like the conversations that we have every Thursday from eight PM UK time on Type Forty Live. Everybody on Type Forty Live. So all of fandom used to be like this, and it was up until a very, very short time ago. So people would get together, air very contrasting takes and ideas they would bring in their real world experiences and their own their own beliefs obviously because we we bring who we are that everything we are to inform our views uh, and in reflected in in the way that we relate to one another you know some people get on better than others sometimes people just don't get one another's points of views they can't tune in to the frequency they can't relate to what the other person is saying but that's all part of us all rubbing along together as the human race. And this is, you know, a show like a show like Type 40 Live is exactly the same as an internet forum. It's a microcosm of, of those things. We are, um, no, I mean, the show, the show certainly never, never sets out to be controversial. Again, the, this is another idea that, that really, 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 really makes me laugh. I mean, I, I certainly reject the idea. And I've heard this, I know what people, because our show and myself in particular, yeah, it depends on who you talk to, some people consider me to be quite a, quite a notorious figure of, of some sort, uh, or the idea that I'm, uh, I'm some kind of shock jock. And all we're doing is talking about the telly. You know, culture and pop culture, it is important. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I, you know, I do get very suspicious. It's an indicator of many, many things. I get suspicious when, for example, the mainstream media lie about pop culture, as they do, because I always think, well, if they lie about the telly, then what's to stop them lying about the things that are important? So it's not that I don't think it's important, but the we start out with simply on this show, we have conversations. We have the conversations that we believe that fans have always had largely about the same things. <laughs> we just, but we're doing them in the here and the now concerning the show, Doctor Who, as it is now, what it was to us when we were, when we were younger, whether that was in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, or the noughties, and where it where it could go in the future. So these aren't controversial. It's not a controversial show, certainly not by design. It's just Doctor Who fans getting together and talking about Doctor Who. Uh, it's it's all about the conversation. Now, if, if anybody considers the conversations themselves or the the views expressed in those, if anybody considers those controversial, then to uh, for the most part, uh, that has to be in the the eye or the ear. Of of the beholder, it's um, it's the same with any kind of any kind of viewpoint, really. It's whether you receive them as being commendable, 
whether they're particularly palatable, you know, you hear something you don't like, and you know, we all do that. You hear views that don't line up with yours. You think, you know, it's a bad take or what you really think that then we all sort of recoil a little, but, um, I think the, the balance, the balance is important and that tolerance of other people's views, voices and experiences is some, a, uh, not a gift, but I think it's a courtesy that people are, are starting to forget in many respects. I think that in listening to one another about any, any topic I can think under the sun, come to think of it. I mean, there are, there are several topics in the world. There are probably a dozen or so which are universally controversial that whenever you start talking about them, people get very, very charged, very, very animated and very adversarial very, very quickly. I don't think that Doctor Who is one of them, or I certainly don't think it needs to be one of them. So a lot of it, it's really down to the individual and how they receive it. And uh, I can't, I can't possibly, I can't possibly uh, legislate, legislate for any of that. Do you, do you follow me? Yeah, I do, Dan. That's that's. Uh, so you, it, it's obvious that you're not trying to be the Howard Stern of Doctor Who fans. No, no, we set out to <laughs> explore, to to make one another laugh, make one another think, mm-hmm. and if that works, then I think the the reasoning. And I, I can't speak for, I don't like to speak for everybody who's who's on the show, but. We all know each other pretty well. And I think that's why we, that's why we, for the most part, we get on and we certainly respect one another. It's because we all feel largely the same way about that. That the, Again, these were conversations we, like I said at the top of the show, these are conversations we would be having anyway with somebody. And so okay. we just share them and we, you know, we moderate them. We present them in a certain kind of way uh, to make them entertaining. That's what, that's what it's all about to be to be entertaining and to give people a little time out for a couple of hours where they can get together with people who are like-minded who largely enjoy even if they don't enjoy the same brand of doctor who that they do doctor who has brought us all together and uh, yeah, maybe i'd like to think we can now and again open minds maybe we close a couple of minds i don't know but that's also a, a risk i'm willing to take it's just the telly <laughs> Right. Okay. Very good. Um, I uh, I enjoy the program uh, as as mentioned, Thank you. and I think I think that other people uh, would enjoy it, uh, it, it if they're aware of it. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to interview you was to try to get the word out there a little bit more. You know, I think that there should be more people watching it, more people interacting, um, because well, don't you is... find don't you find Greg that that when people are shocked by something by something they've heard by an opinion or by a topic. I can't believe you talked. I can't believe, I can't believe you allowed that. Then word about that travels a lot, lot quicker, particularly on social media. You know, and some, some people have tarred our show with a certain brush. You know, it's that, it's that sexist, racist, homophobic Dr. Who show that's on, <laughs> you know, because we will explore ideas in a pretty bold way. We will have the conversations that people genuinely have, not the conversations that people like to pretend that they have. And don't get me wrong, we don't, uh, we're not old fashioned in our beliefs or anything like that, but we'll ha- we will have a free exchange, a free exchange, proper free speech. Free speech is so important. We've, we've only got the illusion of free speech in Great Britain at the moment. It's seriously under threat. This is something that I won't compromise on Type 40, on Type 40 Live in particular. And everybody on the show feels, feels exactly the same way about that. But that's balanced out. It's the same approach we have to, to conversations that people may fiercely disagree about. We don't treat those any differently than the conversations we have about the latest Doctor Who merchandise. So the idea out there that we are uh, we are this show, this this controversial show, or this hateful show is, is completely ludicrous. I mean, I, I think I said to you before, this is something we've been making the show for a long time before I even realised this. I'm the only straight white guy on my show most weeks. And so the idea, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the idea that we're this racist, homophobic, uh, misogynist show is, is quite ridiculous. And the idea that any of the things that we put out there are deliberately inflammatory or controversial, similarly so. I mean, I once asked some, I once asked my audience live on YouTube, have you ever knocked your mum or dad out with a with an item of Doctor Who merchandise. <laughs> a lot of the time I'm wearing a silly hat. You know, I, 
does that sound like does that sound controversial to you <laughs> does that sound <laughs> shocking to you well you know uh controversy breeds attention but uh i yes. i don't yeah i don't consider your show to be controversial um because even though i've seen people that do that have views that uh differ from my own um mm, me too i realize i i realize that that's their opinion and and see things like that make me think i don't want people to agree with me all the time and i don't want to agree with them all the time wouldn't that be really boring it, it is interesting to see someone that has a different point of view that that you can possibly learn from you know give you something to ponder on and well, we, no, we've, you, don't, you don't have to agree with them one of the things i think the statement that i see trotted out a lot on twitter yes i use twitter everybody sorry i use twitter it, um and <laughs> Twitter sometimes gets a bad rap. I think it's a very creative place. I've met some great people on Twitter. But a phrase that I see used a lot on Twitter is the expression, the disclaimer, when they're talking about someone who someone out there views as problematic. Everybody views somebody as problematic. And they'll say, I don't agree with everything he stroke she says. And I always think, God, isn't it a pity? And even I've said that sometimes. Could, what a ridiculous thing to say. I can't think of a single person that I know in my day to day, I've ever in my family, anybody I've ever worked with, where I agree with everything, <laughs> with everything right. they say. Right. It's, it's, right. It shouldn't even need saying, should it? No, it should. Greg, so, I don't. <laughs> I don't agree. I don't agree with everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, let me let me use the AI to try to find those instances. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dan, listen. This I I'm getting. I'm learning exactly what I wanted from you and thank you very much and we are uh about to run over the hour that i asked you for got some plates so, got some uh, plates we, yeah we can keep going as long as you want okay yeah <laughs> i actually really do want to um i have a couple of more questions that i had uh, written down in advance Ooh. um but we can go beyond that if you want we can even go unscripted um but well it's not really scripted i have a, the questions that i wanted to ask but oh, we can so, keep yeah. going after that so um yeah. We, we've covered the thing about is the program controversial and and no and i've concluded that no it's not but there may be opinions expressed by individuals on it that other people could perceive to be controversial so um that that's the yeah, way that, I that's see completely it. on that's completely on them yeah. okay perfect perfect okay um so one thing that i i wonder uh is the the process of content creation can really be a pain, uh, especially when it comes to editing. Um, that is my least favorite thing. After I interview Join the club. someone, um, yeah, after I interview someone, uh, the editing is just, uh, it's not my forte, okay? I actually bought Adobe Premiere Pro uh, or purchased a uh, free trial uh, of it and uh, signed up for a free trial. That's it. I didn't actually buy it. And the reason is because it made me feel stupid. And I actually believe that Adobe Premiere Pro is not in English because I, I tried to learn how to use that. And the majority of the words and the processes that are being described are not something that I was ever taught in school. <laughs> it, it, it is extremely complicated. And uh, I canceled the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, free trial and just went back to some more really basic tools. So um, I don't really edit unless there's something that needs to be cut out. Like if someone's doorbell rings or they get a phone call or something like that. A, a or a really, a, Yeah, well, I'll leave those in. But, uh, you know, a really <laughs> bad sneeze or something like that. Um, so I know that there is an editorial process that you have to go through. And I have always wondered, I wonder how many days, how many hours a day is Dan sitting there when he's not on, uh, when he's not producing a podcast or on live on a program, how much time is he spending behind the scenes editing and using software and stuff like that? Well, yeah, the, with Type 40 Live, I mean, the clue is in the name. It goes out completely live on YouTube for two and a half hours every Thursday evening. And what happens on that stream is literally, there's no delay on that show. It goes out totally live. Nothing, nothing is edited before or after those shows. And so, yeah, I, I know this might sound like lunacy. 
<laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, Type 40 Live is not even slightly edited. It, no. I don't know if that ever comes across. Uh, and sometimes things do go wrong. Quite often things go wrong. Uh, but you know, we tend to just, just go with it, just roll with it. And you know, again, sometimes people, you know, sometimes people word you know, the situations where people could word things better. But again, that's the same with every conversation. We don't always choose our words as carefully as we could. We're not always as sensitive as we could be to, to other people in the conversation. We're not always in full possession of facts. We don't always remember the names of the directors of whatever Doctor Who stories from whatever season. Sometimes we get, you know, get the writers attached to the wrong stories, things like that. But that's all part of the fun of being, being a Doctor Who fan. Again, those are the conversations that fans have always had in the way that they've always had them. And so we to make again, it's just it's just it just seems appropriate that when we say something is is live, it truly is live and a real representation of the things that we we think and feel and the energy of knowing that I wouldn't say anything can happen obviously we we know what we're going to talk about on those shows most of the time apart from one show mm-hmm. <laughs> where things went <laughs> completely off the road. Uh, you, if you've seen that show you probably know which one I mean um so apart from one show of the 90 odd that we've made we always know what we're going to talk about uh, but other than that, no, there's no editing involved whatsoever. The podcast is edited uh, because, again, that goes onto a network which goes across all podcatchers and goes onto digital radio and and, and radio on demand and things like that. Uh, so uh, that is edited, which um, myself and the network, you know, we've got uh, technicians and we've got a team that work on on those shows. So it's uh, a well a well oiled machine at the fandom podcast network so um surprisingly little time less time than you than you think is spent editing editing anything on any of the shows and i think that comes with time that comes with that comes with like anything any any craft any tool any tool set that you've got uh i'd like to think i can deliver a pretty clean show that doesn't really require uh, require a great amount of editing uh, sometimes, you know, some guests that we have on the on the podcast in particular, they you know they may ask for approval on the show before it's published, which we're happy to do that. Uh, and now and again, have asked for things to be taken out, or for things to be put back in, or <laughs> things like that. So there's always that window. You know, we ve- we tr- we treat our guests very very well. That's I'd like to think that's why a lot of them come back, happy to come back and talk to us again. But no, in, in answer to your question, surprisingly little time is uh, spent editing those shows. Uh, I think that could be what gives them some of their character. Uh, that's for the audience to decide. That's for the listener to uh, to tell you rather than rather than me. I think. Okay, very interesting. That's that's not what I expected. I uh, the 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 Type Forty Live show. I'm glad that you did mention that it is unedited because it is streamed as it happens. Um, and I was wondering with the other programs um, that are pre-recorded, uh, the podcasts that are not live, how much time you spend editing. And, and uh, it sounds like you have a little bit of help. Which ones uh, go out on the radio? Anything, well, anything that's just type 40. So type 40 that is a Doctor Who podcast, uh, which we, again, <laughs> and I appreciate it's a little confusing because there was, what I realized was, because this medium is changing all the time. And what we find now is because, you know, I consider myself to be a podcaster and podcasting is a, a vocal, it's a vocal thing. Uh, but now, you know, most, most podcasts uh, and most podcasters, you know, high profile podcasters uh, put them out as videos as well. So now I think after, you know, I've been doing it for five years. So now I think something that was purely associated with audio, people now, I think, expect there to be video versions of most podcasts, or certainly they expect to find them find them on YouTube, even if some of them don't do that well. You know, at least they're there for people. So the, again, my rationale was, if I'm recording these shows through Zoom, Zoom records a video track anyway, so I've had video tracks to every show I've ever made, but we used to just delete them, just get rid of them. But well, I've got a video track. People want video tracks to these shows, YouTube and the podcasting world is kind of different. It's a different audience. So what about if instead of deleting them, I just take the video track, put those on YouTube too, and 
you affect because hey, it's it's just made sense. It just made complete sense. Okay. Okay. I remember there was a term vodcast at one mm. point, and I, I guess they never really uh, uh no, people it's never, never really taken off. I so yeah. I sometimes use the expression vodcast and people just say, What? What? What's, yeah, exactly. What's he talking exactly. about? So I just say podcast now, and yes, yeah, so it's a catch-all. But yeah, the, so I've got so we've got Type Forty, which is a Doctor Who podcast, which its natural home is in your ears. It's on all the podcasts, but there are video tra- tracks to that as well. Again, on the YouTube channel, and then there's Type Forty Live, which is sort of the reverse of that, which is made for YouTube. It's made for a live audience, and, and so that's its natural home. But I take the soundtracks of those live streams and I put those out as podcasts as well. So with the, you know, with the express uh, disclaimer, I suppose, you know, look, I and I say at the start of all of those shows, this is recorded completely live. So, it's a, you know, so you get, it does what it says in the tin. You know? <laughs> so again, I multi-purpose the, I multi-purpose the content because it just makes sense. Okay, perfect. All right. So you're not a YouTuber. You're definitely not an influencer, but you are you are a well, successful podcaster. No, it, it's, I'm a YouTuber by I'm a YouTuber by default. But for me, I, I, okay. again, if I if I think about somebody being a YouTuber, I think it's a very specific brand of content. So if somebody is a YouTuber, um, I yeah, I think because I didn't start out on that platform. Again, it's I don't think it's for me to say if people think I'm a YouTuber by default, then it's fine. And there's nothing wrong with being a YouTuber. But the, okay. uh, my my shows, even the live ones, I, I consider them to be. I approach them in the same way, and I, I yeah, with with the same sort of responsibility, I suppose. That treat okay, them. very good. Now, um, I consider your podcasting endeavors to be a success, and I recognized that early on. I, it was either a year or two ago when I started watching your program, and. Um, that's one of the reasons that I contacted you and said, hey, can I interview you? Um, because I do consider what you're doing to be successful. And it should be pretty obvious um, if people will just tune in and listen or, or watch uh, one of the programs uh, online. And um, I believe that there may be uh, people that would, would like to emulate what you're doing. You know, I, I believe that someone is going to watch this interview in the future um, with goals, dreams, aspirations. They may want to become a YouTuber or a successful podcaster or even an influencer. <laughs> but um, they, they, if people are looking to you for advice in, in, in something that you've obviously become successful and entertaining at, um, what is the best advice that you could give somebody? Uh, based on your own experience, advice. Uh, I think. I mean, I do. People do reach out to me about about this, which I find I still find strange, because as you say, uh, you know, I've got a, a modest YouTube channel, uh, but uh, again, you, <laughs> you know, uh, YouTube is a very funny platform. And if they if they decide if they decide they don't like you on their platform, you know they can actually make moves to limit your reach, to to not recommend your channel or your content to the people that it may appeal to. And, uh, and sometimes I do feel that YouTube is against is against us because uh, YouTube is against, in my view, YouTube isn't isn't for free speech. It's not a forum for free speech. I think there's far too much interference from from that platform. Um, but Generally, because to me, you see, what's what's really important, and if I was to give any advice to anybody looking to do it, it's the same advice that was given to me, really, is to um, whatever whatever your views about anything, whatever your passions are, uh, to be uh, unapologetic about your passions, certainly, to be authentic. I think authenticity in 2023 is um, in increasingly short supply. Somehow, I I enjoy um, I enjoy hyperbole and language. I like words quite a lot, uh, but <laughs> generally speaking, I think people people can see through people can see through unnecessary hyperbole, and uh, and so I would resist that. I'd certainly resist compelled or, or prescribed speech and thought of any kind. And ask yourself, 
ask yourself what you'd like to, what you like to hear and what you like to see and uh, what the kind of conversations that you feel that you can have or the kind of content that you feel it is within your gift to, uh, to create and what that could unlock in you, the creative part of you. Because I, I view it as a creative thing. How, it is how I do it. With some people, it could be more expressive. Again, again that depends on the kind of person that you are. Yeah, so, it, yeah, yeah, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one to, to nail down, but I think th- you can't go really that far wrong with authenticity. And this is something that I like to bear in mind when I'm hosting the, the shows, when I'm, I'm sat in the chair, chairing discussions or interviewing people, you know, cause I do what you're doing to me today. You know, I interview people all the time and I always think about, you know, what were the questions that I think, what would I, the questions that I'd like me to ask if it wasn't me sat here, I view myself very much as the proxy for, for the audience in that respect. So I, I make, I make the content aware of that responsibility and and i i'm very much in the moment as well i think i think it's important to be in the moment and people can tell when you're not and to yeah and to anticipate to anticipate what would make for an entertaining conversation to be to be engaged you know particularly if people you know on, on type 40 live on youtube when they go to youtube if people have decided because we get a lot of people on our show there are people who dip in and out and it's and we know that it's it's there's something for everybody on that show. I'd like to think that, but there are people who spend an entire you know an evening, basically two two and a half hours, watching that live stream show on a on a Thursday night. And so I, the way I view it, I want them to not go anywhere else. It's that whole sort of don't touch that dial thing, whatever the YouTube equivalent is of that. Don't touch that dial. I don't want them going back to to proper telly. I want them to stay with us for the entire show, and I'm going to give them every reason I can to stay watching until until the end credits, until our theme tune, the Type 40 Live theme tune, is the best theme tune in Doctor Who podcasting. I will make <laughs> no I will make no massive claims for my show or indeed myself, but I know we have got the very best theme tune in and, all of Doctor <laughs> Who podcasting. And I'm and not so, gonna disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah and people people snigger but they they know I'm, I'm telling the truth. I mean I again, I can just tell you what I like and what I don't like. How I do things is particular to me. I mean, the things that drive me drive me mad. I mean, I, like I say, I use Twitter, use social media, and apparently there are other Doctor Who podcasts out there. So people tell me, <laughs> there's quite a lot out there. You know, there's a, there's there are a lot of Doctor Who pod, podcasts floating around, and a great many of them use social media to to grow their audience. Some focus a lot, in particular, on growing a. a a, a Twitter following. In fact, there's, a, there's some shows that concentrate more on Twitter than, to, than doing actually making their content. And in my view, it really shows if the show isn't strong enough, it doesn't matter how many followers you've got on, on Twitter. So it, to me, it's a second, it's a secondary thing. And I can't abide. I can't abide the, um, that kind of idea when you see people petitioning through social media, social media is a great tool to drum up interest in what you're doing. But you shouldn't use it to run your show. I, I can't stand that idea. We see people on social media saying, you know, reach, oh, this is your show. We'd like, you know, in, we've got somebody come on, coming on as a guest in, in a couple of episodes' time, and we're interviewing them. We'd like to know what questions you have for this guest. And I'm sitting, I see this on social media, and I won't name the shows that do that, wouldn't be fair. But I, I see this, and I think, what? Hang on. So, so let me get this straight they are coming up with the questions him or her on the show they're going to be answering the questions and i always think to myself you know well the host what exactly are you going to be doing it's, it's right. your <laughs> it's your show i that i cannot stand that abdication of responsibility if you expect people to turn up and be entertained by your content and you just sit there what giving it the big one looking cool because you're the one that's talking to so-and-so we live in the social media age if i want to i don't know i mean if i want to ask colin baker what he had for breakfast i follow him on twitter too i can just tweet him and ask him i don't need you to ask him for me you know so i I believe that as a content creator you you should bring more than that so that's just a something that i believe is asinine and um should be resisted at all times but that could be just me no offense. Okay. Well, you know, you just, uh, you, 
you, you said an ab, what did you say? An ab did, you used a word which I have never oh, heard before. Uh, abdication of responsibility. Well, okay, I have heard it, but I don't believe I've ever heard somebody use that in a sentence. Well, you know, that that does make sense. And um, I think that uh, I've seen those shows. I am re- fact, I'm I saw- responsible. Yeah. I am responsible for, right. for either, a, if I'm talking about YouTube for a, an audience, or if I'm thinking about the podcast for a listener, I'm responsible for them staying with that conversation and having a bloody good time. And and I, I do I take that pretty seriously. I'm not always serious about the conversations that I have, but I don't take pe- the investment of people's time with us. I don't take that for granted. It's, uh, okay. That's a, that's a very good way of putting it. And I, I agree with you uh, there. Um, when I'm pre- preparing for an interview, the first thing I try to do is familiarize myself with who the person is to begin with. And then when coming up with questions, I try to come up with questions that other people would want to hear the answers to. Mm -hmm. Um, And hopefully something that hasn't been asked of the person before. I don't know that I could interview Colin Baker because of the fact that he's been interviewed so many times. What is left to ask him? You know, it's all been answered. But um, it is interesting that you noted uh, asking questions that people would like to be asked. Because I think that that is an important part of the interview, because when someone gives you the time to do an interview, which we've ran over the hour I asked you for, my apology, um, when when someone uh, gives you the time for an interview, um, yes, they, they should Greg, be able I to- knew this was going to overrun, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of suspected it as well. But uh, yeah, we, we can't overrun it a whole lot, though, because we're going to go bowling here in, in a little bit. But uh, <laughs> So you're going to get off the hook here pretty quick, but but um, it, it is that that's interesting the way that you look at that. And um, so the, uh, I, I have I want to come. I'm thinking back about the things that. that the things that drive me nuts as a listener because I listen to a lot of podcasts and I watch a certain amount of YouTube as well. And I'm just thinking about the things that drive me nuts. If I'm listening to something or watching something, I think well, I could have asked them that myself. That's not a good mm-hmm. sign. I like to think that people can watch what we what we do. The conversations that we have, listen to those and think, you know what? I never looked at it quite that way. Oh, I would never have asked that. I would never have thought of that. And right. you know, not all the time, but most of the time, then I feel that I've given people, I've rewarded the investment of somebody's time in a their evening or when they're on the school run listening or watching us. I like to think I've given them a good couple of hours entertainment. Okay, very good. Now, I, I want to come back to that, but uh, there's there's one thing that uh, you made me think of. You said that there's a lot of podcasts out there. Now, that is um, – that's there's an some wonderful, wonderful podcasts out there. Don't get me wrong. There are. <laughs> right, right. Yes, there are. Um, but unfortunately, there is also this desolate wasteland of defunct podcasts, and it's it's sad to see. You know, if you go back over the, the last 10 or 20 years, there are a massive – I'm sure that there are more defunct podcasts than what there are functional today, and and, and probably way more. Um, and I have a, a theory as to why. Um, it's because it's an unpaid job. When you start doing a series for fun of something you enjoy, you have just given yourself an unpaid job because Doctor Who in particular, we don't own Doctor Who. Okay, that's why we can't use copyrighted material from Doctor Who because it's not ours. Okay, so we can't make a profitable Doctor Who podcast or series. And I think that- Yeah, some people, content makers try, don't they? <laughs> they call yeah, stuff. they do. So some content makers, I'm really surprised get by with, uh, with what, what they will use. <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, theory I have is that people get burned out because they they start all gung ho they're like all right we're going to have a new live episode every 24 hours okay <laughs> and then all of a sudden they start sounding tired and then it's oh every week and then it's every 6 months and then it's gone so what what do you do to prevent getting burned out uh, well i we're very very clear about the fact that anybody who's involved in the show uh, they've not they, you know, they've not joined the Moonies or anything like that. They've not joined the Foreign Legion. They're allowed to leave at any time. So people, uh, people can give of their time when they're free. It's a, it's um, I never take that for granted either. And I, I, I'm pretty sure they all know that. 
uh, I don't take them for granted and I, and I certainly never feel like they do me either. And I think that's because we respect one another. Um, we like one another. We may not agree with one another all the time, but that's how we, I, th- I think I can speak for everybody and, and, and say that there are some big characters on my show as well. That's, <laughs> you know, we're, we're an eclectic bunch, but somehow it's, um, yeah, it just works. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> How do you keep from getting burned out? Uh, How do you keep from getting you, burned out? You, uh, right. Well, yeah, I mean, with the with the podcasts, again, I'm very, very clear about what's expected of me uh, from the network. And if it ever got to the point where I would feel burnt, uh, burnt out or couldn't do the show, I, I'm sure they'd be receptive to that and they'd be understanding of that. And um, yes, but I'm very, very clear how many podcasts that network needs from me in the, in, in a calendar year. Uh, and what what I can deliver in a feasible period of time, what the space book can deliver because the, the space book produces the podcast for the network. And um, yeah, I, I'm always cited on that. There are certain ways that I, I build it in to, uh, to my average week or month so that I, I know what I know what my goals are for the year. I mean we, the way we handle that on YouTube, is that as anybody will know, I mean, uh, I don't know exactly when you're putting this out, but the moment I'm speaking to you, and one of the reasons why I've been able to find the time to finally get to chat to you like this is because at the moment we're on, we're on break. We're on a, like a three week break for the public holidays in Great Britain for the Easter holidays. And again, uh, I, uh, I, we put the, the show out every Thursday, but we also build in these breaks because a lot of us have got families, loved ones. We like to go away on holiday and uh, you know, if um, if people can't make it during public holidays, then why I'd I'd rather take the show off for two or three weeks. It gives gives people a chance to do the things that they want to do, come back refreshed, reinvigorated, and gives the audience a chance to miss us as well. You know, because on again on YouTube, on YouTube, what I what I find is and this is human nature. If you're there all the time, every single week. People, you know, people could, because I've done it, you can't, you can get to the point, the point where you could take things for granted. You could get complacent and say, well, I missed it this week. It, uh, it won't matter. It'll be on. It, it'll be on again this Thursday. I'll just watch that one. I'll skip that one. No, I don't want people skipping my shows. Thank you very much. <laughs> but the, in, in all seriousness, though, uh, the, this is why I make them in blocks. This is why it, it happens the way it does. Uh, just to give people that time to recharge, to come back with lots more to talk about, and and so it, it won't ever get to to that point. It was certainly not for the foreseeable future. I mean, Doctor Who is at such a a particular place at the moment, and things are about to change. You know, the show is in the process of a of a kind of a, a prolonged regeneration of its own that's going to happen. It's, it began last October. It's still going on now, and it's we're going to watch it evolve and regenerate probably over the best part of the next year. I, th- I would imagine that we will finally see the full, the fully formed new version, all new Doctor Who will be properly manifest, probably for next Easter. This is an immensely exciting time to be a Doctor Who fan. And so I want to make sure that we are, we're there on, on the cusp of it. We're having the conversations that we like to have amongst, amongst people, you know, amongst our group. And the new people that we bring into the guests, this is another thing we've started to do, you know, as you grow an audience, you know, people, people spot you and people from uh, other sides, other content creators, or people involved in, in Doctor Who and various aspects of Doctor Who say, I'd love to come on. I'd love to come and have a chat. And so we're in a position now where people, they don't invite themselves on as such, but yeah, I've got some great guests coming up in the next run of Type 40, which begins uh, any moment now, depends on when you're publishing this. And because we've had a few weeks away, I think we're all pretty recharged and very much, very much up for it. So this is not the, the obviously you can't prevent burnout 100 percent because people are people, uh, you know, touch wood and all that. Things happen in an average life, but the way that we present our show is in such a way. And it, 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 as a television series, I suppose that in seasons, in blocks. So we we. Um, know how many shows we're going to make roughly and we pretty much stick to that whether a big story breaks or not we we stick to that okay very good interesting answer dan 
God. Oh, okay. I re- that I really went on then, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm glad because that, that is something that people uh, can learn from. And that that's that's the, the that's the whole point of this interview, and that is something that people can learn from. And a, a matter of fact, I just learned from you um, that taking a break is a good idea because when we went to Japan in March, um, I was going to do an interview with a famous Doctor Who author, and the whole plan was I was going to interview him from Mount Fuji with Mount Fuji in the background. Well, it was a great idea. But it was also uh, a bit stressful to try to figure out how to do to get the laptop outside and what have you. And I ended up not doing it and took a break. And I think that was good. So I didn't do any interviews in March. And um, it kind of gave me uh, renewed enthusiasm to start doing interviews again after taking a break. So I'm glad that you that you you touched on that, because I guess if somebody is doing a uh, podcast series and they start out doing one once a week, um, they can always take off and skip a month. And I think that that may be a really good idea uh, to prevent burnout. That's something I hadn't thought of. So I'm glad you went on. That That's a very interesting point of view there. So I, can, I can only speak from, I can only speak from experience. And uh, again, my, my, uh, my approach, my um, philosophy of it, you know, the other viewpoints are available and that's fine. I can only speak from, for mine. And, and our show, a particularly Type 40 Live, will continue to – it's it's evolved the entire time we've been making them. As I say, it started out as a lockdown project that was going to be a one-off, then it was going to be 10, then it was going to be another 10, and now it's a, a full a full series that we have a lot of lovely feedback from and, and some now and again that's not so lovely, but that's fine too. So – and it will continue to evolve. I, we have – we have plans for what we'd like to do with it next. Obviously, we're aware that Doctor Who is changing, and so coverage of it changes. Uh, this, the, the platforms that we put this material out on, but, uh, be they podcasters or YouTube, all that constantly changes. You know, we can't, we can't stop that. We can't resist that. I personally choose to embrace it. I choose to see it as another creative challenge, and I'm very, very excited about uh, not just about what uh, about the Doctor Who that's to come in the next 12 months. So I'm very excited about getting the opportunity to talk about it with anybody who's happy to have the conversation and to anybody who, who presses play. Okay. That is the perfect lead in to our final question here. Um, thank And thank you for surviving. <laughs> um, uh, and yes. here it is. Uh, how excited are Drum you roll. about the return of Russell T Davies uh, that some fans have coined as RTD2 and <laughs> our new upcoming doctor as performed by Shuti Gatwa. I'm going to be awkward and tackle those in reverse order. Uh, Shuti okay. Gatwa, <laughs> Shuti Gatwa is a, uh, an unknown quantity to me. I was, I, which I'm very, very pleased about. I believe that the doctor, the role of the doctor is at its best, a star making role. It made a star of Matt Smith. It made a star of David Tennant, even though, you know, say he'd done plenty of things before but it made a star of david tennant it made a it made a star of tom baker and uh it's um i think it made a star of william hartnell i'm sorry william he, he, he had a great career before he was the doctor but um yeah that role and, and hartnell i think that was the one that's made him a star that that's endured him and means that he'll never be forgotten but it's a star making role and it has to be the right star at the right time, the right talent. I've never seen Shuti Gatwa act in anything apart from a commercial for a, a console game that he did a couple of years ago now, where he plays this, um, he plays a, uh, a Lewis Hamilton kind of racing car driver or full of swagger. It's got, there's a lot of machismo in this advert. And uh, I, I found that I saw the spark, you know, that the charisma, the spark in his eyes that, okay, I think I see why you've chosen this guy. And I was tempted to go and watch Sex Education, the big Netflix show that he's part of, Mm -hmm. which I understand the role that he plays in that. Uh, Eric, I think the character's name is. It couldn't be more different from from the character in this ad. And I think, oh, maybe I should go and watch that. But no, I think with Matt Smith, I'd never seen Matt Smith act in anything until the 11th hour. I'm choosing to do that here. I have every faith that they've got the right man at the right time. I, I know Shooty Gatwa is not an unknown, but he sort of is. Uh, he's, being, he's got a massive Instagram following. Yeah, it's fine with people who use Instagram, isn't it? 
I'm very, very excited about it. They promised that he's going to do something with the role that's never been done before, which, um, again, I feel tremors with that because you think, what do you mean by that? But it's mostly incredibly exciting because, uh, yeah, when somebody's attached, when somebody seems to be this charged with energy, this up for a challenge, and it's at this time in their career, it seems like the right role at the right time for him as well. And it's certainly the right time for Doctor Who to get a reinvention. I'm not just talking about a change of the lead actor. A, a real reinvention, an injection of cash, yeah, that helps, but an injection of creativity too, a real boost to creativity and vision. And that's where Russell T. Davis comes in, steering the ship. Russell T. Davis, obviously, uh, we're, we're over a decade on from when he left the show initially. Uh, it's not the same Russell T. Davis, not the exact same Russell T. Davis that's returning to the show that left it in 2009. And Russell, some of his choices that he's made that have been announced at this point have raised a few eyebrows, including mine. Nevertheless, in my view, Russell T. Davis is Britain's greatest living populist screenwriter of this age. And I include... I include people like Jimmy McGovern in that. I think Russell is brilliant at what he does. I think he is a true visionary writer. And I don't use that word lightly. Am I going to like everything that is on screen on, on his watch this time? Look, I didn't before. There's no reason why I should now. But I loved his original era. I am. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, well, Russell T Davies, he's just come off. He, he could have done anything after It's a Sin and A Very British Scandal. I mean, a Very British Scandal is probably my favourite of everything he's ever done. He could have done anything at this point in, in his career, but he's chosen to come back to Doctor Who. He seems to have uh, as much energy and enthusiasm and vision for it now as he had back in 2003, 2004. I'm very excited about what's to come. And yeah, happy 60th anniversary. To Doctor Who, to to you, Greg, and to you. Mm -hmm. Thank thank you kindly, Dan. Um, so let, let's go ahead and wrap it up because I did ask you for an hour, and we've gone considerably over that. And um, I I love the answers, and I, I appreciate your time uh, in in letting me interview you um, because you know I've been looking forward to this, and and now some questions have been asked of you, which I know other people have been wondering. They have to have so. Um, to, to go ahead and conclude this, uh, was there anything that you wish that I had asked you that I didn't? Not that I can think of. Okay. okay <laughs> Not that I can good. think now, of. I mean, I'm, I'm happy surprising. to talk about pretty much anything. No. Nope. <laughs> All right. Very good, Dan. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up. And um, to anyone watching or listening to this, uh, do yourself a favor and go check out Facebook. I mean, I enjoy it, uh, and and I do believe that uh, Doctor Who fans, even Star Trek fans, uh, uh, will find something that they will love over at Dan's channels. And uh, so go check it out. Thank We're you. gonna put the links here down below. Um, so uh, what's what's next for you today, Dan? I guess you're not gonna have to go edit anything, right? <laughs> it's it's getting it's getting quite late. So I will, okay. I'll have a, I'll have a bite to eat and I'll probably watch something on the television. Maybe not Doctor Who, uh, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll watch some, I'll watch something that will make me laugh, make me smile. And yeah, probably an old sitcom or something like that. I don't know, but that's, yeah, that's it for me for the evening. And I've got to phone my son as well. I've just, cause he's just got back. He, he's just got back to London. So I'm going to see, make sure that he got back there safely. And uh, yeah, <laughs> just okay. check in. Very good. <laughs> All righty. And we're, we're going to go bowling because it's only, uh, it's, it's, uh, noon here uh so uh we, we've got a, another good seven or eight hours of daylight left so we'll have maybe a fantastic gardening as well <laughs> have a fantastic day greg and and the family and okay and thank you thank you for inviting me on i've really enjoyed speaking to you at long last yes sir dan thank you so much this was really cool and uh i will see you around on the wires <laughs>
Establish visual contact. Lower communications barrier. Identify yourselves. State your identity. Identify. Daleks do not take orders. Outline resembles the inferior species known as Cybermen. Destroy the Cybermen with one 